started recently, eh? Yeah. yeah. So talk about how that happened. How many days ago was it and how did it evolve? Well, about uh, three months ago from, from this time, um, a small group composed of uh, six people, and I wasn't in, involved in that group yet, they were discussing that uh, many of our Pampango province mates didn't have a choice as to the gubernatorial candidates because during the time we had two uh, persons who intended to run as governor of this province. So one is perceived to be the wife of a gambling lord, we call it wedding, and the other is uh, called perceived to be quiet lord involved in um, irregularities, corruption in the government wherein the, the ashes spewed by Mount Pinatubo vol volcano and that erupted in 1991. These materials are used for, for filling materials in construction business. And uh, the revenues that uh, amounted to sizable money were not uh, uh, remitted to the provincial coffers. And uh, majority of these revenues, supposed to be revenues, were pocketed by the governor. So this group uh, thought of uh, fielding up uh, an alternative candidate. I came uh, in in this group only on its third meeting and we discussed how the situation was in Pampanga. We felt that uh, our province was experiencing a moral decaying process wherein uh, corruption, um, malgovernance, and Ill illegal gambling, together with patronage politics, were the name of the, of the game. So we felt that we had to do something to stop this process. And uh, this group which started out with six people became 20, became 30, and it grew in numbers. Mm. You know? Until such time that uh, this group wanted to field an alternative candidate that would advocate for for good governance and for moral leadership. So uh, this group approached uh, something like eight eight possible candidates, Pampango luminaries, whom uh, we felt I was already in this group already. We felt that. Uh, these eight people could lead this crusade for good governance. So all these guys, we approached one by one. And uh, of course, they didn't take up the challenge. You know? uh, because perhaps the, there was this feeling of uh, cynicism and helplessness, not only amongst these candidates whom we felt could lead this crusade, but that was the general sentiment of the people in Bambanga during that time. We felt that uh, the situation was turning from bad to worse. 
and uh, our desperation and our cynicism uh, increased to a level uh, up to a point that we felt we could no longer offer um, an alternative candidate. So this group turned to me <laughs> and asked me if I could uh, lead this group. This group said no. So I asked for a period of a week of prayer and discernment. And also I was supposed to ask my bishop, because I'm a priest, you know, if he would allow me. So, uh, of course, <coughs> as expected by bishop, uh, dissuaded me and told me that uh, he also prayed over this, that uh, after considering every possible angle, he thought it, it was for a wise that I should not run. You know. He told me that according to his conscience I should not run. But after I decided to, to run, I told him that I also have my personal conscience and I will be answerable to God not according to your conscience <laughs> but according to how I listen to my conscience. So what was the deciding point? Well, first of all, I believe in the crusade of this group. I believe that it's high time we do something about the situation. We will try to eradicate, if not completely eradicate, at least to diminish uh, the prevalent uh, corruption, malgovernance, and illegal gambling and patronage politics in our government. So I thought that uh, somebody had to lead because all this time uh, we in the church, especially the bishops, we were uh, articulating what we thought would be the Christian principles vis-a-vis -vis this is this uh, these values, you know, or uh, which were prevalent in the Philippine government. But I felt that uh, something more than articulation has to be done. Advocacy has to be done. So I thought that uh, we we had to step to make a step forward. By, by advocating women to work for a good governance, to work for the elimination of this, yeah, as I've said, uh, corruption, malgovernance, patronage politics. So I thought, I, since this group uh, felt that uh, I could be, a, uh, I could lead this group, since they believe in my capacity in my person, perhaps more than I believe myself. <laughs> so I said, why not? Was there one consideration more than others that swung your decision? Well, I think it's uh, also my formation as a priest. Even when we were seminarians, we were trained to be very pastoral, uh, that we would uh, make us our lifestyle, our love for, for the Lord, for the one who called us to priesthood by serving Him, especially in the needy, in the poor and the marginal, marginalized. And then my 26 years of experience as a priest, 20 of such years were spent in micro-enterprise -enter development. You know this, um, this Grameen Bank approach of Professor Yunus of Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. We have been um, replicating that uh, technology here in Pampanga to, to help the poor help themselves. And then my experience of 15 years with the Social Action Center of Pampanga, which was the service arm for the poor, for the needy, uh, of our archdiocese. And I was at the thick of disaster response in 1991 when Pinatuba erupted. So I think it's more of this orientation towards the poor, towards justice, towards people empowerment that uh, urged me, that impelled me, uh, plus the other factors mm. to this decision. And uh, I felt that uh, this decision is not something uh, separate from my priesthood. It is a, a more concrete expression of my priestly life. Was it hard to uh, give up your your life as a priest? Yes, of course. No. I wasn't really giving up my priesthood. Mm. I knew all along that I, will, I would take a leave 
or I would be suspended from my priestly functions. So I knew what that meant. That would mean uh, I would not uh, administer the sacraments, uh, I would not be functioning as a priest, and that was very important to me. Um, something so important that I have to give up in order to respond to this call. But uh, this galvanized more into something deeper by saying then, by saying after some time that I think I have to take whatever it takes to make this decision materialize. Whatever it takes. So now how long ago was that that you made the decision? I decided on March 27, 27. I had my last Mass last March 28. And I also announced my intention to run for public office on that same date of March 28. Mm -hmm. And I filed my candidacy on the 29th, the last day of filing. So that's not very long to get a campaign going and to come as far as you have. Huh? That's true. <laughs> it wasn't long. <laughs> but it's worked pretty well. Huh? It's working pretty well because uh, it's just like a, a like, just like one um, partner has said, one priest has said, that uh, Pampalis is just like a, a whole dry, dry grass all around. It only takes a spark to hmm. make a big fire out of it. This crusade, I believe, is not really about me. It's a people's crusade. And as a believer, I believe it's a, it's a divine crusade. Um, there's a, an old American film that perhaps you would remember. It's called The Candidate. Uh, and uh, the guys decide to run kind of for a lark. And at the end of the film, they, to their great surprise, win. And the candidate turns to his manager and says, What do we do now? <laughs> if you win, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm gonna do? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, uh, my experience in public service, not government service, no. I haven't served our government in any capacity. But my public service as a priest, I believe it will work uh, for me, for my advantage. Mm -hmm. And then there is synergy that is happening all around us now. A lot of people are have owned standing for and working for our crusade. You know? And I'm a, a, a team person. I work more with a team in my previous uh, previous assignments. You know? And I have a feel of what the problems are. Mm -hmm. What I believe I should do is start with myself. You know? Leadership by example. Um, and then Another very important thing is to have a team that would work for me, a team that is competent, with the appropriate track record, good intention, you know. and then the power of conviction. I still believe we have perhaps a good number of people working in the government who haven't uh, uh, forgotten their idealism. Then I believe we just have to be more decisive about what's, what has to be implemented. In the Philippines we have many laws, many legislations, but I believe the problem is implementation of these rules. Mm. So we just have to be more convinced. No? And then I believe we have the support of the different sectors in our community who have uh, endorsed my candidacy, mm -hmm. who could work for me. I mean, would work with me in having a good government. So, is there ways that you see Pampanga being a kind of a microcosm of the whole country? Um, are the, does it really kind of demonstrate the essence of some of the wider ills that, <coughs> that are in action in the country? I believe so. It is a micro, microcosm of the Philippine society. Mm. But in 
more senses than one, I think it's worse here. Mm. Why? Because it's the it's a bailiwick of of uh, wetting, illegal gambling. It's the bailiwick of corruption. And then this is the home province of our Philippine government. Yes. And this province has a history of very uh, very militant, very revolutionary people. This is one, Pampanga is one of the eight provinces which were the first ones to revolt against Spain, Spanish rule. Mm -hmm. This is a province which fought the Americans in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a history going for us. And then the level of frustration and and uh, what is that? People are fed up with corruption. I think these things are going for us. Let's say you do win. Um, do you see <coughs> that uh, having an effect on the rest of the country? I mean, the implications really are quite major, are they not? Uh, this is a machine that you would defeat that uh, controls a lot more than this province. Yes, I believe so. And but uh, if in case we win, I win. This is not the first case. We have other cases in the past, like the case of Grace Padaka, the governor of Isabel Isabella, and the second time she ran as governor of the province of Isabella, she also won. She didn't have any political machinery, no fans, no, and she was able to win. So. Her experience, our experience, will definitely have a ripple effect in the whole country. And even in this province alone, a good number of uh, candidates approached me and said that they too were running without any much political funds and machinery. And they were hoping to, to keep their expenses very minimal. But their, their uh, candidacy is centered more on good governance rather than on patronage politics. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be a, a, any more specific about the, the power structure here? There's the, the people behind the gambling, the people behind the coring, and you know, the, the kind of lordship that uh, they, they exercise over the rest of the province. Yes. Um, at the moment, the gambling lord, that is the, the husband of the candidate, the lady candidate, is perceived to be very, very uh, influential, wealthy and powerful. And it is a public knowledge that uh, the husband, the wedding lord, is uh, controlling many of the different uh, dimensions of life in the in, in the province, like uh, he is perceived to be a kingmaker before and even now. The perception, he, the perception has been that he has uh, funded the campaigns of the different uh, elected officials from the barangay level up to the national level. The perception has been that he has uh, influenced the coming into power of these different elective officials, including the President of the Philippines. Mm. That's the perception. Right or wrong, it has to be found out. And who is he? What is his name? Bong, Bong uh, Pineda, Mr. Bong Pineda. Mm. And, and then uh, there is also a perception in the province and in the neighboring provinces that he has a hand in the, the appointment of military uh, officials in this province from the municipal level up to the regional level that means Pampanga and different neighboring provinces so uh, with this perception um, it's not far-fetched according to some that the wedding lord is the first cousin of the drug lord, you know, these are the perceptions. No? But even before that, if 
If, for example, the lady candidate wins, the name is Lilia. The apprehension of many Pampango stand. The, really, the person who is really, who, who would really run the province is the husband, Bo. No? And if he wins, if he, he is the, he's the lord of the province, and well, wedding lord, he would also become the quality lord. Quality lord is the other big issue mm. in this province. No? The, uh, the son that I was referring you to uh, has become a very big source of funds, of revenues in the province. But unfortunately, um, about 85 to 90 percent of the funds did not really enter the, the provincial coffers. The perception is these funds were pocketed by the current um, governor of the, of the province. So the governor, in, the incumbent governor, is running also for a second term. And if the lady would win in this gubernatorial post, so that would, would mean the fusion of lordship, of illegal gambling and, and quite a lord. And Bong himself is running for office as well? No, he's no. He's, he's kind of behind the scene. He's behind the scene, but not exactly. Hmm. Because uh, according to reports we have gathered, it is the first time that Bong has directed and presided over campaigns of his wife. Mm. Uh, meaning to say before he was ju he would just fund, he would not be seen campaigning in public for any particular candidate. But now according to our reports, he has been very, very visible in these campaigns and alleged vote buying sessions. Mm -hmm. Himself giving directions, presiding over meetings, etc. So there's something new. <laughs> so um, there's the moral overtones of the of your whole campaign, but can you be more specific about some of the things that you would begin to implement once you are in office? Well, I would be if I assume office of the governorship transparency. Now we will account all the transactions in the government, all the revenues. You know, and all the expenses. Uh, one particular thing would be, one big thing is the bidding of construction projects, infrastructures of the government. We will make this really transparent because the, the perception now it's not really an open bidding. Only the friends of the people in power take turns in getting the projects. Mm -hmm. now. And then uh, the reality of uh, of what we call SOP. What's that? <laughs> like for example, a, a a government project. Let's let's take a, a, an example. A road. Only about thirty-five to forty percent of the budget really goes into the implementation of the project. The rest, of course, the the contractor has to earn. But besides the income of the contractor the more than 50% is pocketed by the different layers of of people in the government. Mm -hmm. no. Well, at least the majority of them, that's, the, the, that's being done by the majority of those people in power, according to this study and perception. So, like uh, this SOP, I am supposed to receive something like how much? 10%? 20% of the income? So I will not receive anything, no? because uh, it would be immoral for a priest <laughs> to get himself and en rich. Because I've been a simple guy for the past 26 years, I don't have any intention of of altering my my lifestyle. No? So you change the standard operating procedure. Yes, yeah. and I would begin with myself, yeah. so that I could uh, have a moral. Uh, what he calls a moral ground to convince the other officials to do the same thing. You know? And then uh, the quarry, illegal quarry practices. You know? I will see to it that all the quarry uh, revenues would be remitted to the coffers of the government. 
I will try my best to eliminate, if not diminish, a wedding in the province. Mm -hmm. So, one particular thing that I intend to do is to activate what we call the local development councils, which is mandated by the local government code in our constitution. These LDCs are, com are composite of the local executives, the line agents of the government, and the civil society. Pampanga is still very weak when it comes to the local society, a civil society get, getting involved in public governance. Local society are the uh, people's organizations, non-governmental organizations, representatives of the different sectors in the land, like farmers, women, fishermen, academe, uh, different religious denominations. Mm -hmm. So I intend to really activate the LDCs, which is the arm of the government that would uh, uh, enact and and go for uh, a, a people's development agenda and see to it that this agenda gets funded and implemented. In the United States there is a tradition of the separation of church and state and uh, it occurred to me that if a priest were running for high office in the United States, people would raise this as a as a kind of red herring or a, a red flag of alarm. How would you respond to that concern? In the Philippines, uh, the first place knew <laughs> that I wasn't uh, interested in politics. I didn't have any political ambition in mind. All I wanted was to uh, to continue with my priestly ministry up to my last breath. You know. So uh, the public knew that I was, I underwent a process of discernment. And then, as far as the constitution is concerned, the lawyers would uh, better explain, there are better places to explain this, but uh, I, there is no hindrance in the Philippine constitution that will disallow me because I'm a Filipino, I'm a voter, that I would run for. There's nothing in the Constitution that will disallow me to run. And then as far as the canon laws are concerned, canon law is concerned, that's true. A, there is a provision in canon law, I'm not good in the numbers, <laughs> canon law number, that priests should not be engaged in partisan politics. But under extraordinary situation, and if I am sus suspended from my active prison ministry, then I can run. Has the media covered your campaign in an objective fashion? Or have they engaged in smearing campaigns and so on? Well, I believe uh, by and large we get uh, a good following in the media. And uh, it is the Trine media that has uh, picked up our campaign uh, very very well and then we took advantage of the privilege give, given to us it was very much covered from the day that we were discerning whether we would I would push for my candidacy or not and right away we got a lot of media attention especially from the national media from national media um, after about three weeks after Holy Week, let's say about three weeks ago, we experienced black propaganda, not from the national media, but from the tabloids. You know. So it is for free. I believe in the Philippines, a senator, <coughs> can, a senator candidate would pay something like 200,000 pesos for a two minute media what they call it, advertisement. We're getting a lot of we are being aired more than two minutes more, more most of the time and it is for free so we capitalize on it very very well I noticed earlier you were wearing a bulletproof vest can you talk about that how that affects your campaign and your own personal sense of 
<laughs> I am a simple guy. You know? I am not so much used in this uh, kind of security. But I am a very obedient person. When my security people tell me that I should wear it and I should run or I should stoop down, I follow them very well because they know it. They know it more than I do. Mm -hmm. The dangers are real. The dangers are real. The you know this. Some of these guys have been successful in instilling fear in many of our people. Comments on your candidacy and your hopes? Of course we hope to win. <laughs> well, actually, the mere fact that we were able to field an alternative candidate, the mere fact that we were able to uh, get a crusade going, that is a victory for us. The other are bonuses. Just like more and more people say that they have uh, somehow stopped or they, they have diminished their cynicism. People have realized that they have they can hope again. They can some they can expect something beautiful and beneficial would happen out of this. You know? So this is a big bonus for, for our people. And we have this song Kapampangan Ko, which we've been singing for a number of years. It speaks about the, uh, a very idealistic Pampango, uh, a Pampango society that is very progressive, very dignified and dignifying. But we were saying this song very, very, uh, what? Very, very uh, shallowly, without any feeling at all. But now this song has become a very, very powerful expression of a people that is hoping again, that has uh, uh, gone over to a large extent, has transcended these uh, obstacles of, of hoping again. You know? And then the other bonus, of course, is to it. <laughs>